Good morning, uh, my friends from Hemp Engineering around the world. This is a new interview with one of my dearest um, pioneers on the industrial hemp uh, business. Uh, Mr. Carl Martel has been a great influence in not only in, in, in the business of that I'm trying to push, but also in many other uh, projects that are being executed around the world. Mr. Carr is right now in Paraguay. He's being uh, uh, hired by, by the Paraguayan government to basically kick off the um, uh, industry in that country. Welcome, Mr. Carr. Well, thank you very much, Ron. Great to be here. Always love chatting with you, so. Yeah, so, um, we go straight to the point, I guess, huh? <laughs> Why not? How did you end up in the hemp business? Well, I, um, how did I end up in this business? I basically I came home back from the Middle East uh, over a decade ago, and I was doing work on the house. And, um, you know, I really didn't like the building materials that, you know, I, the options that I had, you know, some of it was expensive, what I wanted to do and different things. And, you know, it, it came back, you know, I thought, you know, um, you know the uh, straw bales and stuff like that. And I, and I said, nah, it's not going to work. It's getting moldy or this sort of thing. And I remembered hemp, you know, from years before. And um, I said, so I picked up the phone one day and I called up the CHTA. <laughs> Excuse me. And I said, do you know where I can get some, some herd? I want to make some hemp cream. And that's how basically it kind of started. So it was just by me calling them up and then them telling me, uh, actually they said, where are you from? I said, I'm from Ottawa. And they said, uh, you know where Renfrew is? And I said, yeah, it's basically just across the river from me. And um, they go, because a farmer just started actually doing some uh, uh, cropping there of hemp and everything else. And, um, you know, here's his number. I said, Fantastic, and that's how I met Ruben Stone of uh, Valley Bio, and um, basically started off uh, right there, going in the fields, and um, you know I came, went, got some of the, the herd. I bought like a basically a drum full that he sold me, and then uh, I give him a call back about two weeks later, and he goes, um, and I say I'd like to get one of the big bales, but uh, I don't have a truck to bring it down for me. He says sure. So he loads up one of the big big uh, four by I guess like four by eight by four bales. It was a big bale. Brought it down and you know, he goes, uh, so what are you doing with all this? I said, well, I'm using make some hempcrete and some other things. I made this, uh, I made the, the, the fiber fireproof and stuff like that with a coating that I, that I did. So, you know, it was kind of like that bad insulation uh, that you the fiberglass insulation. And he goes, no. I said, yeah. I said, he goes, show me. So we took a lighter out, tried lighting the, the, the fiber and he goes, Wow, that's really cool. Starts filming it, and you know, we got to talking and everything else. And he, um, so I said, "How much do you want for the bale?" And he goes, "Nothing. Just keep on doing what you're doing, and I'll keep feeding you the bales." So I said, "Awesome. Thank you very much." <laughs> so that's how I basically fell into it, and you know, learning how to decorticate basically uh, the old-fashioned way. You know, in my yard and doing it all manually and everything else, separating the fiber from the herd and you know, exploring all those different things. So really hands-on that way. And then started using it in the house and building different things, put it in my floors now and everywhere. So I do it right. ever do a renovation, I bring that in. You know, I started experimenting with the products and, you know, I was talking more and more with Ruben. He goes, you know, he didn't invite me out. He says, we're having a field day. Can you bring some of your products with you? I said, sure. I brought that out. Just kind of encouraged me. And I just kept on kind of going. And uh, eventually he started a... Uh, a seed cleaning business with because he also has uh, hemp genetics uh, that he was basically selling and that was uh, Anka and a few other seed varieties um, that he was selling it's a monoecious variety and I got to working more and more with him you know he called me up and said hey you want to come to the field I said yeah for sure so get out there and you know we got the, the combines going and little did I know though that he wanted me in the back of the combine and think something goes wrong I gotta climb in there and cut things out or whatever <laughs> you know we had to uh, discover all these the growing pains of using some of the early industry kind of a tools that were there you know learning you know where where things would wrap on the machines and you know cutting those off and how to collect them um, you know and even one day you know we ended up with, with some issues of, of E. coli on the on the seed and then uh, developed basically a um, 
a disinfection system for the grain and it's, it doesn't use any heat or other things that way. Um, and it's basically, it's just, uh, it's ozonated water that I was using to uh, disinfect the grain with and it uh, works great. And, you know, we were able to uh, move forward with that. And I kept experimenting, doing different things with, with, the, with the hemp. Uh, at about the same time, I was asked, um, Quebec government was doing some projects in regards to revitalizing some of their uh, heritage buildings. They wanted a heritage paint to, to go on. And um, I was asked, you know, can, can you do this? I think my archaeological background and some heritage building, whatnot. I said, yeah, I can do this. And like I say, at the same time, I was being introduced to this hemp oil. And I was like, um, Mr. Zan said, well, it's very, very similar to, to flaxseed or linseed oil. And started replacing basically the, the linseed with, the, with this expired food grade hemp oil. And lo and behold, a few a year later, whatever, I had a, um, basically an expired food grade hemp oil paint, right? The paints and stains that we can use on barn buildings and floors and all kinds of things. And uh, um, it was, you know, it was great. So I just kept doing these things, making these different things, the geo hemp, uh, which is basically kind of like hemp creeds, but instead the binder, instead of being lime, I was also working at the time with uh, geopolymers. Um, that did back probably Oh, four or five years before that sort of thing. So I was doing some interesting things there and then I said, oh, I wonder what would happen if I combine the two of them together and then I was making basically these very, very hard surfaces but very lightweight because of the hemp. You know, it would be about half the weight of the granite or half the weight of concrete, but just as strong and uh, made for some very interesting things that I could actually do with it. Very, you know, um, so, but... Hempcrete, the idea behind hempcrete, I mean, you can make these geocrete blocks or geo hemp, what I call it. You know, you can build walls with it and other things like that too. And they'd be much more structural than we have with, with hempcrete. But, you know, there's a trade-off. You know, you can have that hard structure, you know, right away and everything else, but then you're losing the insulative nature of, of hempcrete. So, you know, there's always a trade-off. So I, you know, I, I said, okay, well, that, that for one, some applications go with the geo hemp countertops, for example. And then, but for walls and buildings, and I was like, oh no, we got to stay with the hempcrete. The properties were much more um, conducive to that. So was, that's that's where I kind of went. Um, in the um, kind of direction. Uh, Scar, and uh, I, uh, you have, you're very, you're talking very humble about those past projects, and I do know that it has changed the curves of of the industry itself. I'm aware of that. <laughs> So, <laughs> so along the way, I believe that you have encountered, like most of hunters around the world, the um, stigma of the, of, of the of the plant itself and the prohibition. And I would like yes. to listen a little bit of your perspective about it. Okay. I know of um, you strong belief that the that the plant to be should have only one name without discriminating uh, him and yes, her. yes as, a, as a starter. And that has been a, a fight of yours, which I many of us support behind you. But it's a long way to well, education purposes, yes. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess I can touch on that, but uh, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a topic I need to continue and I need to finish working on uh, in regards to hemp cannabis and the, and the naming and you know what's going on in the states and all those sort of things um i think it's very important you know that, that the taxonomy of this of this uh, plant right be understood and demystified and um really come to a common language in regards to it right uh, you know when people are talking about you know I've, I've heard many people talk, say, oh yeah, hemp is the, is the male of cannabis, or all, I would have heard all kinds of crazy things uh, in regards to that. They even, you know, they, 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 they'll use hemp as, you know, just another word for, for some cannabis, but I don't know. It, it, to me, it, it always seems, that the word hemp, when I actually went and looked it up, it, you know, it's really just the German word, like anything else, or the English word now, right, for cannabis. And if you follow it back in history and the linguistics of the, um, 
root of, of that word, it essentially means the same thing as it does in French. In French, they call it chanvre, right? Which is cannabis, right? In English, it's hemp, right? Which means cannabis. In Germany, they have another word, hemp, right? It means cannabis. In uh, Spain, cañamo, right? Well, that's just the Spanish word for cannabis. And if you follow the roots back, uh, that's, that's the derivative goes right back to uh, being cannabis. And it goes back even further and everything else. And, and you can see how at some point in the past, you know, in the Indo-European language where it actually broke off into these different um, words and even you can even see where at one point, how the, the K of cannabis was replaced by either a C in Latin or an H in German, right? And that's how then that word changed to become hemp. But uh, the original word would have been like, you know, went from cannabis to and then the H to cha the, the K changed to an H and cannabis and so on and so forth. And eventually, you know, we ended up with the word hemp. But at the end of the day, it really just means cannabis. And that, that word goes back, you know, thousands of years. So, and, and, and so today though, you know, they're, they talk about, you know, in the United States to make a differentiation, Canada too. They say we have hemp and we have cannabis. No, no, we don't, right? We have, we have a cannabis industry, that's it. You know, and yes, okay, we can talk about as well, you know, the cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, cannabis ruralis, you know, there, there's that. Some scientists support, you know, the, the binomial terms, you know, cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, cannabis ruralis, and even just two species. They'll say just, there's only two, there's only indica and, and sativa. But I think as time goes on, we understand more and more and science comes out and, and makes it clear, you know, it, it's more than that. And, and even the word, for example, sativa, you know, a lot of people don't, don't realize, um, and welcome to go look it up, um, sativa, really all that word means, and this is before prohibition never started when cannabis was, was around, people would have known it for cannabis rope and, you know, the sales and these sort of things. Uh, cannabis sativa, the word sativa actually means cultivated or domesticated, but it can also mean health. And if you look at um, really a lot of the foods that we eat to sustain our life, okay, lettuce, okay, if you look at its Latin name, you're going to see sativa. You know, you look at garlic, it's sativum. Um, if you, what's another one? Oats, it's uh, I have one sativa, right? The, these are very important kind of um, denomination vegetables and foods, foods that actually are identified as bringing health for us. You know, we need to eat these 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 things to to maintain our health. And yet, somebody, you know, very wise, I can imagine, uh, hundreds of years ago. I guess Carlos Linnaeus was what back in 17 something or other. Uh, doesn't really matter. Back then, when he was coming up with the the terminologies, his Latin naming, the botanical names that we use today in science, right? Gave the word for cannabis sativa. So it means cultivated, it also means health, you know, something that we eat, right? So even to the point today, you know, I was still trying to explain to people, it's like, um, you know, I'm talking about, because when you say cannabis, the stigma that's attached to that is, as soon as you say cannabis, people think automatically marijuana or smoking it, getting high from it. And it's like, listen, try to explain to people, I'm saying, look, cannabis, okay, is more than just marijuana or whatever. It's our food. If you look at it you eat, and we eat it, it's very, it's known as a superfood for the, for the seeds, but also the flower is a superfood. There's it has mm -hmm. tons of nutritional mm -hmm. benefits. Yeah, yes. uh, you know, the, 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 this, this, this idea of thinking that it, it's like when somebody walks into a supermarket. If I said, okay, I walk into a supermarket and I look at a potato, what's the first thing you think of? Vodka? No. no. Or rice, do we think sake? No, we, we're thinking food, right? Same as grapes, you know? And, and you know, I hear arguments, oh, well, if we made uh, cannabis legal and we put it on the, uh, you know, right beside lettuce in the store, kids will run in there and buy it up and run home and start smoking it. <laughs> and it's like, well, I guess they could do the same with potatoes. They can run in there, scoop up tons, bring it home and 
and, and on fermented, you know, uh, the, the same sort of thing. So you know, is, I think it's just uh, because the education is required to actually get past some of these statements that are attached. That's what I was going to say, because um, uh, when you look at the prohibition itself, uh, the job that the governments have done to educate the people yeah. wrongly about the about the plan about the plan been extraordinary extraordinary they have been smart they have put a lot of money on this um, the war has been misled to what it actually is so it exactly. is uh, it's a um, it's a great work ahead that the industry must overcome if we want to, you know, encourage as many people as we can. Sorry. Exactly. I mean, in time, in time will be, if this will all change, but it just takes time, effort to undo all the damage that was actually done by, by our, our governments around the world that are, you know, because our mentality or thinking today of all this young generation, everybody else, that when you say the word cannabis, you immediately think marijuana or yes. joints or getting high. Right. This is a direct result of governments actually feeding this information to you over generations. Right. And it's the same thing. You know, we're only, you know, we create some of these, I'm creating some of these things. I'm only rediscovering these, a lot of these things making books. I mean, fiber, I was, it was funny just the other day, you know, I'm watching a pipe, uh, pipe fitter doing some work. And this is well known all throughout Latin America. And they and they're still using it. I was I was shocked. I was saw he was putting some fiber around the pipe, and I'm going. And to me, it looked very much like hemp. And I was going. I felt it and everything else. I go, is that natural or or is it synthetic fiber? He goes, it's canyamo. And I said, really? And he goes, yeah. And he said we use it for sealing pipes against water and air. Now we've been using it for generations. Oh, so oh, wow. in some places, they've never forgotten the use of it. Right. This is here in Paraguay. You know. And, and I said, how much? How much does it cost? You know, it's like for for basically 250 grams, they buy it for a hundred thousand guaranis or something like this, really? and um, which is about 20 bucks actually, or 18 dollars Canadian, something like that. And and so and and that product is most likely being imported from from Europe, right? But this is something that has been able to be maintained in their society, you know, uh, unlike. And the others where it was actually drilled out of us and, and removed, you know, but now we're relearning some of these things that, you know, the same thing with the paints, you know, these oils can be used for paints for, for generations and whatnot, but now we're only relearning some of these things because, you know, of governments removing it from us and telling us that, you know, it's a drug and that's all that they tell us, right? Um, you know, uh, when there's so much more we can do with it. Some hamsters believe that eventually the governments will be accountable for the deaths that they have occurred for hiding the knowledge, this knowledge of, from the people so that they can cure themselves in terms of medicine and all this. I don't believe so, but I guess- I don't um, think. Yeah, I believe that the- Government, governments, governments can, are never held accountable because by the time things are understood and everything else, 25 years or 50 years have passed and those politicians are gone. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, the, the governments can never be, never, yeah. you know, unless you, unless you hold them to account today, you know, but uh, no, 25 years from now, 50 years, what are they going to do? Oh, oops, sorry. What's yeah. that going to do? I agree with you. Because you. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the ones that are going to be apologizing are going to be the generation that actually grew up with, without prohibition. Right, so they really, actually understand it, you know, it's like, well, right. you know, well, right. you know, we're going to apologize for our fathers and whatnot for, for doing this. It wasn't even their fault, it was from their father's fathers, you know, so it's like. No, no, I agree. You know, I, I agree. Um, I have always said that we cannot judge today, we cannot judge the history from what we know today, because the circumstances are different, the situations were different, and you only yeah. can, it's, it is what it is. Card, so exactly. um, tell us where you, what, what you're after, your, your projects, your dreams moving forward. What are my dreams? Well, it's to continue uh, growing this industry, growing it uh, around the world. You know, uh, I'll always go wherever, you know, it, it's, it's needed. And, you know, I want to see this industry come back into its glory days and, 
uh, return to its, its rightful place of prominence in agriculture, you know, um, be part of a, a rotational crop that, you know, services people. I mean, the, the, the amount of food and protein that this plant can produce is, is, is incredible. So, you know, instead of going with monoculture, you know, we look at doing things where, you know, we, we're, we're implementing and intercropping and, and other things you know, with, 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 our, with our foods. And the beauty of hemp is that, you know, it's, it's not just a food, it can be a lot of other things. Sure, you can harvest food, but then you also harvest it, the, the waste for all kinds of other things. You know, you can have these dual use crops, you can have even tri use crops, you know, because your hemp, right, can, can what they call hemp, I call it industrial cannabis, right? So industrial hemp to me, doesn't really exist and shouldn't exist. It's, it's industrial cannabis. You know, you have you'll have recreational cannabis, you have industrial cannabis, and sure you have a medicinal cannabis in, in between, but that's kind of a smoke screen because the medicinal side can come from you know both the recreational and the industrial strains that are there. You know, the recreational might have higher potencies of some of the CBD, the THC, the um, THCV, and CBG, these sort of things. The while well, whereas the the industrial varieties have a lower amounts, but it's been actually demonstrated that you know you can still extract medicines from the the wastes that are generated from the agricultural crops, the industrial crops. You know, so you have say thousands of acres you're harvesting for grain, and if you have a dual use where you have a, a crop out there that you know grows to say two meters in height, right? Well, okay, that first meter is basically your seed and flower. And, and then that harvest is through, but you can capture the residuals from all that. And then what's left in the field are gonna have one meter stocks. Well, those actually turn out to be just right for when you're bailing it up and everything else, not too long. So right there is you, you have a, another thing. So you can have three crop, three harvests off of one crop, you know, and <coughs> the biomass that it generates and produces, <coughs> we can do any number of things. Like I say, we can harvest it for food right away. And people say, Oh, what if you turn to biology? Well, okay, well, you can do that, but you can also turn it into ethanol instead. And that would be the cellulosic ethanol, you know, from the from the waste. Not I'm not talking about the food side. So you're growing for so you'd be able to have a plant that actually grows your food and also one that grows your your fuel, you know. Um, so that you know that potential exists there with this plant. Um this um car uh, somehow bring us to the understanding that since since the last 500 years or so, there has been a clash between the science and, and the power of governments. Um, uh, when Copernic, or Copernic um, stated that, Copernicus? yes, when he stated that the, that the earth was around the sun and not the other way around as the church was stating, uh, that caused his life and they cut his head. I believe that we are somehow in the same time where the science itself is telling the governments, hey, you guys are wrong. We need to change the law. And that is costing a lot of life for that thinking. Uh, there is so much potential in the projects that can help to overcome hunger, clothing, sure. um, accommodations that, uh, it's not enough time to be arguing with politicians that they are just following an 80 years old stigma created by a prohibition that was basically fundamentally uh, driven by discrimination uh, for, for some races and also for emerging industries. So I guess we are now in 2021 and we have so much to to overcome. Carl, do you truly believe that the, the hemp industry or the cannabis industry can help um, to create a self-sustainable economy, a uh, circular economy? Yes. Yeah, I mean, this, uh, the simple answer is yes. You know, I think, I think it, it can definitely help um, create that economy, the circular economy that you talk about. In, in, Number in a number of ways, as as I've just been describing, you know, um, and even more so, because it, it can also be it's a, a large biomass crop, you know, the 
um, we'll talk about carbon sequestration for a minute. So, you know, there, there is a talk in regards to climate change and, and, and CO2 and um, that sort of thing and how, you know, there has to be work has to be done so that to, to correct, you know, some of the uh, anthropogenic carbon dioxide that's being emitted, um, trying to neutralize that or find ways that we can actually lock it up. Um, and, and, and hemp is actually a really good candidate for, to help with that. And I'm not saying just that, I mean, agricultural crops in general, the, the waste, you know, the sugar cane and other ones that can be actually used as well to, um, to, to, to help facilitate and create that change. Um, you know, you're so right, trying to, you're, so talk, right Robert, you're so right on this, uh, yeah. because now there is a technology that I've been reading in the last six months that there is a company in the United States and another one in India that they are able to transform hemp into wood. That would yeah. help a lot, lot of countries that are, you know, creating deforestation all sure. around their their land. So yes, yeah, okay. absolutely. You know, and that that's that's one way of actually locking up that carbon into a usable product that we can use and then build with. You know, another one too is. Um, you know, locking up that carbon in, in another way. I mean, okay, so that piece of wood, say, for example, you make and build a house, well, you'll get either decades or, you know, a century out of that um, that material, right? So as long as it stays in the, in the building, you know, it can last a thousand years. Houses in Europe have been built and you know, the wood that's in there, some of it is, you know, a thousand years old. Um, so, you know, it's one way of doing it. The, the, another way too of locking up carbon that we've, that we've seen is, is actually converting the that wood, if you want, into carbon, like charcoal, right? And that that has a, a way of, of very long lasting. You know, we find it in in very old soils, agricultural soils in Brazil called terra preta, that you know date back eight thousand years. And so this carbon is very stable. So when we're talking about you know locking and doing carbon sequestration, well, you know we can take that material and then car carbonize it. And then that becomes a very stable carbon for for a very long time. Now, and and you know, you know my work as well. You know, doing some things in batteries, and you know, I try to get people to think about you know how we how we use carbon today. You know, if, if you think for a second, you say, okay, they take this piece of wood, you dry it, put a match to it, they light it, and then <clears throat> basically they release that energy from that piece of wood, and and then. <clears throat> excuse me, you know, a piece of wood, the, the, the heat that's generated from, from burning it then, you know, creates the, the heat necessary to create energy and blah, 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 um, you know, turns a steam engine, so on and so forth. The, the, the problem with that though is, okay, you release that lot of energy right away, okay, but then it, that's emitted back into the atmosphere, right? Whereas if you have a closed loop system for, for pyrolysis, where you can actually take that material, put it in, carbonize it, uh, take that carbon out, turn it into uh, electrical plates, for example, you know, for, for say a dual carbon battery where you have a carbon plane, a carbon plate, um, and this is will be very stable, everything else, and it's just carbon. And you have solar that charges up these, these super capacitors if you want, and then releases the energy, but you can keep doing this time and again for you know, thousands and thousands of cycles, yes. right? And at the end of it, well, you can clean them up and use them again, right? Because it's, it's just carbon. Um, you know, how much more energy are you getting out of that same amount of wood um, by converting it into the stable carbon rather than burning it, releasing that energy, releasing the carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere when, you know, this is just another way of thinking about how do we use that, that carbon? I mean, the same thing too, we can be using that for, say there's all this kind of excess. Well that carbon can actually be mixed with lime and you can make walls out of it. I'm keeping um, on, keep so on, on so going, forth. going and going. Yes, it's, uh, yes. Exactly. Yesterday exactly. I so. mixed a block of hemcrete. Um, uh, I did an experiment like a month ago, it didn't work out. I did an extreme experiment. Then I, I basically uh, smashed the block again and reuse it. So it's unbelievable. You cannot do that with concrete or any other construction material. So right. we're blessed working in this. And Carl, do you have something else that you would like to add to the audience and you, got, you would like to share about your, about your anything that <laughs> will add value to 
our people. It has been very uh, educational, I, this in, interview. <laughs> yeah, I no, I, I enjoy it profusely uh, being able to chat about this all the time. And, um, you know, I just say keep, keep, especially you, Ramon, keep doing what you're doing and keep, keep talking and keep putting the message out there. I think that's one, one of the most important things. Like I say, we have to change the message, you know, uh, in regards to what cannabis really is, you know, that it's a food, it's a building material, it's medicine, you know, and yes, it can be used for recreation, you know, uh, but it's not its primary thing. It's, it's not recreation. For us, you know? it, it's actually food. You know, I'd like to see, you know, more, um, more use of the plant in our diets. And I think, uh, I think in time, uh, science will, um, you know, vindicate basically this plant as being a, a preventative type of food, you know, it, it, in the sense that, think of it this way in a certain way, you know, the, some of the, some of the first uh, sailors across the ocean, right, had scurvy, and uh, how did they treat the scurvy? Well, they had fruit, right? That, that it was vitamin C that actually corrected that problem. So food is a very important preventative tool in, in, our, in our disease. And I think, especially now I mean, with COVID and everything else, you know, some people are getting very, very sick. Some people aren't, right? We live in a world right now where, you know, I, I know people that have, you know, they, they live in families where they've gotten sick with COVID, but they've never got it, you know, or they've had very mild conditions. So plenty of people like that. Sure, some people are dying, you know, and those are gonna be the, you know, a lot of the, most of the people that are dying are very, very old or they're very, very sick. You know, so this, this, this crop, I think can really help us, um, you know, to, to, to get beyond and give us a really strong immune system to fight off, you know, the, the sort of diseases that are, that are coming upon us. Right. I think, I think one day it'll be shown that, you know, cannabis is, is that food, you know, I'm not saying, I didn't say drug, right. Is that food that helps our bodies maintain, um, that homeostasis, if you want, of good, you know, body condition, and uh, you know, eating it raw, you know, those those raw cannabinoids, right, in its raw state, you know, the, the acidic forms, I think, will, will turn out to be uh, a very important um, thing in our diet. I think it's a, just a, a matter of time until science comes out and says, yes, you should be eating this every day, you know, like uh, like you do an apple or an orange. Like you know, uh, to help help keep you healthy, yep. you know, this this plant will help you, right? Activate everything in your body, you know, I'm, I'm and, uh, and and yes. keep you healthy. Yes, yes. Carl, like always, has been a great pleasure talking to you. I'm very sure this plant will feed a lot of souls, and this chat will also feed a lot of knowledge. I hope so. Bring a lot of light to a lot of people. Thank you very much once again, Carl. We'll be in touch very soon. We got a lot of work to do. <laughs> we do. We do. Thank you very much, my brother. Have a good night. You have a great. You have a great day on the other side of the world, and uh, I'm going to be going to bed there pretty soon. So. I mean, talk to you again soon. Regards. Thank you. Bye. Bye.